joining me today is the Latok County Prosecutor, Bill Thompson, University of Idaho President, Scott Green, Provost and Vice President, Tori Lawrence, University of Idaho Dean of Students, Blaine Eccles, Latok County Sheriff, Richie Skiles, Chief Deputy of Latok County, Tim Best, Idaho State Police Colonel, Kedrick Wills. The Moscow Police Department would like to extend our condolences to all family members, friends, the University of Idaho, and the Moscow community. This was a horrible crime that took the lives of Ethan Chapman, Zanna Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Clay Kaylee Goncalves. This horrible crime has affected all of us, the families, the University of Idaho, our community, our country, and our officers. Agencies that are involved in this task force include Latok County Sheriff's Office, the Idaho State Police, and the Federal Bureau of Investigations. As we continue our investigation, we have learned that Ethan and Zana were at a party on campus, and Madison and Kaylee were at a downtown bar. They arrived home sometime after 1.45. If anyone in our community or across our nation has any information about these times or the victim's whereabouts, please call our tip line at 208-883-7180. The facts of the case that we know right now. We know that these homicides occurred in the early morning hours of Sunday, November 13th. Around noon, Moscow officers received a call of an unconscious person. Officers discovered the bodies of Ethan Chapman, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Goncavs inside the residence on King Road. The four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. Investigators are continuing to collect evidence at the scene. Investigators are working to develop a timeline to relevant events. Autopsies are taking place today on all the victims so we can continue to gather evidence and solve the crime. Investigators are working to follow up on all leads and to identify a person of interest. Based on details at the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. We do not have a suspect at this time, and that individual is still out there. We cannot say that there's no threat to the community. And as we have stated, please stay vigilant, report any suspicious activity, and be aware of your surroundings at all times. What we do know, or what we don't know, excuse me, the identity and location of the suspect, the location of the knife or any clothing that was worn by the suspect. Currently, we have 25 plus investigators working this case, as well as assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Idaho State Police. We're reviewing video that has been collected, but we are asking citizens to contact us with any information you may have that will help in this investigation. Once again, we're asking anyone with a tip to call the tip line at 208-883-7180. At this time, I would like to introduce the University of Idaho President, Scott Green. Thank you, Chief Fry. Uh, I'm Scott Green, president of the University of Idaho, and, and with me is Tori Lawrence. He's our provost, and uh, Blaine Eccles, our dean of students, uh, will be available for questions after uh, all, all of the statements are made. Uh, the crime, to us, this crime and the loss of these young lives is just simply beyond comprehension. While our, smart, our small community is certainly not immune to such things, it's not a situation our close-knit campus is used to dealing with. First, my deepest condolences to the families. And friends of Ethan, 
Kaylee, Zena, and Madison. <clears throat> Excuse me. Their loss has been devastating and they were bright lights in our community and are deeply missed and remain in our thoughts and our prayers. We've been working with Moscow police since we were notified on Sunday of the crime. We've helped with, um, we've helped when asked and continually pushed for information whenever possible. Knowing that we cannot interfere with the important work and good investigations that are, that are occurring. We just want justice for these victims. Our focus at the university is to support our students and our, and our employees. We are encouraging students and employees to take care of themselves as we head into Thanksgiving break. I wanna take a moment to commend our faculty and staff who have been on the front lines helping our students, whether that is providing counseling to those in need of support, accommodating those who want to travel home, or engaging those who find comfort in staying busy interacting with their peers and our instructors in class. Our employees stepped up when our students needed them. While we have relied heavily on the expertise of Moscow police, we feel confident that remaining open with flexibility to leave allows our students to decide what is best for them. The weeks ahead will continue to challenge us as this loss and the circumstances around this crime become known. We will support each other as we grieve and we'll move through this together as a Vandal family. Thank you. I would like to have uh, Colonel Kedrick Wills come to the podium, please. Good afternoon. My name is Kedrick Wills. I serve as the director of the Idaho State Police. And uh, as we have this discussion today, I'd like to express my appreciation for your attendance here because it's important, vitally important, that we get the information that we have out to the public. Crime knows no boundaries, and these murders have shaken us to our very core. You heard the university president as well as the chief of police talk about this small community, and it's a very close, tight-knit community. And our hearts break for the families that lost their loved ones, the University of Idaho, the Moscow community, and even within our entire state. Be assured, the Idaho State Police is firmly in support of the work that the Moscow Police Department is doing, and we are providing every resource that we can to make sure that this comes to us to a conclusion and that with the person or people that this is responsible are brought to justice. It's so important that you understand that this takes a team effort. This is teamwork with the university, with this Moscow City Police Department, the Latah County Sheriff's Office, the Idaho State Police, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It takes everybody to be able to do this. And it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act of getting the community the information that they need to have with making sure that we provide a case that the Latah County Prosecutor's Office can go forward with. Governor Little, Idaho's governor, has assured me that the full weight of all the resources we have within our state are available to Chief Fry and to his team. Our crime lab is also involved with processing evidence and our law enforcement throughout the region, state and federal agencies continue to provide resources. From the Idaho State Police's perspective, we've provided detectives here from this area, as well as detectives from out of the area, state police detectives, as well as patrol resources and uh, communication uh, assistance as well to provide for Chief Fry and his team. Following this, uh, this, this briefing, our communications uh, director from the Idaho State Police, Aaron Snell, if you'd raise your hand, Aaron. He will be the contact for all press uh, media inquiries from here on out. Uh, with um, He'll be working closely with Chief Fry and his team. And we have additional, uh, like I said, additional patrol and investigation resources brought to bear here as well. We want to do everything we can to make sure that this is done correctly and that the people that are responsible for this are brought to justice. So at this time, um, I'm going to open it up to some questions um, that I'm sure you have, and we'll do the best we can to uh, answer those for you. Hello, Chief Ray. Hello. Thank you for having us. Um, 
This is Amanda, I'm Amanda Rowley with Crem2 News. Uh, you mentioned that there's uh, an indication that it's an isolated targeted incident and there is an individual somewhere. Can you give us a reason as to why there's that belief there is a suspect? And can you also uh, give a little more information on the force entry? There's no sign of force entry, but was the door, did it seem like any of the entries were left unlocked by any means? I'll add to the last part there, just because it's at the front end of my uh, mind. We're not 100% sure if the door was unlocked, but there was no damage to anything and the door was still open um, when we got there. And, and my first question, yeah. if, you don't, if you'd like me to read. No, I, I, think, I, I think I haven't. Um, you know, in these cases, we take the totality of the things that we see and they're, and they're very dynamic, right? And they're very big and there's a lot of information and we try to take that information and some of it we can't share with you, correct? Um, but we try to take that information, we try to make the best educated decision we can. We uh, review that as a team with our um, detectives, along with our prosecutors, along with the university, and we try to make that best um, decision on that. So we, um, at, at that time, believe that um, you know there was no uh, a threat and our, our goal is to provide safety for this community we are that's why we're bringing in the resources we're bringing we want a close to this and we want to do everything we can to um let the people in our community know that we care we want um, them to feel safe we want them to be safe and uh, we're going to do everything we can to do that and if i could add one more question um, you asked for videos to, or anything from the community to help put together that timeline. Uh, we obtained a copy of Twitch video and family members of the Gonsalves family were able to identify uh, Maddie and Kaylee in those videos at a food truck ordering food. Is the police department, our investigators aware of that video and, and has it helped put together that timeline? We are aware of that video and it has helped. It gives us um, a time and space where uh, we know that um, two of our victims were and that helps us a ton and we'll continue to follow up all leads that we can and um, continue to gather those. Any indication of a party at the home that night? Um, and I'm, this will be the last one, okay, I understand. Um, not that we know of, not at the home. Um, we know that the other, um, let me get the names exactly right here. We know that um, Zaina and um, Ethan were at a different party on campus. But, but that timeline will still help us if other people know that, about that. Thank you. Chief Wright, John Webb with KHQ. Um, on September 12th, uh, there was a vandal alert that was sent out about a potential stabbing threat on Paradise Path. Does this have any connection with what we've seen so far? Not that we know of it, but we're following up every lead. Every piece of information we get, we are following up to ensure that um, nothing has gone unturned. We want to have um, the individual identified um, who is the suspect of this eventually. Um, so we are literally looking into every aspect of everything. And you guys have said repeatedly, that there's no threat to the public, but we don't know who the suspect is. We don't know where he's at. How is there no threat to the public at this point? Well, that's kind of an unknown. Like I said, we took the information that we had at the time, um, but we do need to be aware. The individual is still out there, right? Uh, we need to be vigilant. We need to uh, watch out for our neighbors. We're a community policing um, community. We've said that um, for years, and it's the community that watches out for each other. We need to continue to do that until we can um, close this off and make an arrest. Why has there been such limited information over the past couple of days? I mean, we're almost four days into this. Why has it been so limited? Yeah, it's a difficult, um, we have a lot of information coming in and you know we have um, tried to push out some information through press releases, um, but the reality is um, I probably should have been standing here a day or so ago, but I'm here now. We're gonna continue to be here. We're gonna continue to give you the information we can. Um, we care about this community. I care about this community. I've worked here for 27 years. I want this community to be the safest community around. So the mayor has called it a crime of passion. Is there any indication that that's true? Um, we're looking into every aspect of this. Um, I, I'm not going to st stipulate whether it's uh, one thing or another. We're going to continue to investigate until we have the facts, because really it's the facts that will drive um, what the cause of this is. And as we gather evidence, we'll get that. So. Okay.
One Somebody last else? question, if I could, Chief. Um, have, have we looked at any boyfriends or any ex-boyfriends, any spouses as a potential suspect? I will tell you, we are looking at everyone. Um, we are every tip we get, every lead we get. There's no one that we're not going to talk to. There's no one we're not going to interview. There's no one that we're not going to look into. Um, and we're going to do our due diligence. We're going to make sure that uh, nothing goes unturned and that we um, do everything we can with the assistance of all the resources we have to um, get a final answer. Okay, thanks, Chief Ryan. Uh, so there were, oh, sorry, I'm Emma Epperly with this book's Hi. interview. Hi. Um, so there were other uh, roommates who lived at that, uh, that residence. Um, were the roommates home at the time of the attack? Uh, there, was, um, there was other people home at that time, but we are, not just focusing just on them, we're focusing on everybody that um, may be coming and going from that residence. So since they were home, was it a hostage situation? No, it was not. Um, and then did um, they didn't call it into police, so were they um, injured? They were not injured, um, but like I said, we're still following up with everybody that um, could have been in that area. And how can you say it's a uh, targeted attack if um, you don't have a suspect? Like I said, we take the totality of the situation. We try to make the best um, bit of information we can with everything that comes in, and then we make our decision off of that. So at this time, I'm not going to expand upon that. Um, but like I've said, we do have a suspect out somewhere, and we are looking for that individual to uh, solve this. Hi, uh, Rachel Sun, Northwest Public Broadcasting. I just want to clarify something you said earlier over the past couple of days, the information that we've been getting is there's not a threat to the public. And earlier I heard you say, you can't be sure that there is no threat. I just want to clarify what um, your stance is on that at this time. So we, we did believe, we still believe it's a targeted attack. But the reality is, is there's still a, a person out there who committed four horrible, horrible crimes. So I think we got to go back to, um, there, there is a, a threat out there still, possibly. We don't know, we don't believe it's going to be to anybody else, but we all have to be um, aware of our surroundings and make sure that we're watching out for each other. Okay, and then one other follow-up. Um... I know you said when the call came in, it was for an unconscious per person, and also that was a stabbing. It seems, just from an outside perspective looking in, like that would be um, not the first thing <laughs> a, a person calling in would think. You're right. Um, but the report that we got was that it was an unconscious individual. It wasn't until our officers arrived on scene, um, went in to do um, caregiving check on the individual who was unconscious that we um, found the scene that we found. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Heather Roberts with ABC News. Just to follow up on what she asked, so the other two roommates were there at the time of the attack? All the information that we have from our investigation is that yes, they were. Okay, but they were unhurt. That is correct. So is there any explanation as to why it took so long then for someone to call 911 you have surviving witnesses to an incident at three or four in the morning and the 911 call didn't come until noon? I don't think I ever said that they were witnesses. I said they were there. Um, so, you know, we don't know why that call came in at noon and not um, in the middle of the night. Um, would have we loved for that to have happened? Yes, but that, that's not how it took place. So um, we're, that's why we're investigating everything still to try to pull all the pieces together. Were they one of the people, were, were they the 911 caller? Um, at this point in time, um, I'm not going to divulge who our 911 caller is um, just because I want to keep the um, integrity of the investigation at this point, okay? Okay. And last question, are you able to tell whether the same weapon was used on all four victims? You know, that's why we're having the autopsies done. The autopsy will confirm that and hopefully collect um, some evidence for us, um, even from, from those. That's why you do um, the autopsies is to try to be thorough and try to gather more. So um, we'll leave that. That, that. that would probably be something that would come out later. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me, Derek Chubb, Fox News, Fox News Digital. Uh, was there anything missing in the home or were the purses still there? Any robbery attempt, anything like that? Nothing that uh, we have identified. 
and I'm going to take about two more questions. All right. Hi, I'm Tim with the uh, Daily Evergreen. I was just wondering, um, were the two other individuals present at the home when police responded at noon? Yes. Okay. Uh, Chief, if you don't mind elaborating a bit more on those those two people, well, was it two people? Um, what have those people shared about the circumstances of that night, what they saw or didn't see? Well, I'm not going to um, go into what they shared um, that night. Obviously, that's part of our investigation. That's part of the information that we're trying to um, build our complete story with. So um, at that, as far as that goes, we're not going to go any further into um, what they what they know and what they don't know. How, how, many, how many were there? Um, we believe two. Have you looked into the social media accounts of all the different victims, and do you uh, we understand that one may have had uh, an account linked to um, her uh, Instagram account? Uh, have you looked into those accounts? Have you seen any sort of threats made to any of the individuals? So we are looking at all um, resources. You know, we got, like I said, the Federal Bureau of Investigation helping us. We got our detectives, our forensic detectives looking into that. We're trying to pull this whole picture. We're looking at everything that we can look at, social media, et cetera. Um, so to answer your question, yes, we are. Were the victims all found in one part of the house? I'm not gonna divulge that either. That's part of our investigation. Um, and at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and close this off. Um, but if you'd like to, if you have any questions for the university, um, we'll open that up at this point in time. Who has not had a chance to answer, ask a question? Yes, over here. Um, yes. Oh, okay, thanks. Actually, I had a question for the chief, so I don't know. Okay, well, we're passing. What is the university um, doing to uh, make their students feel safe? Yeah, great, great question. Um, at this time, I think I'll turn this over to, to Blaine, who's been dealing directly with our students and, and, and dealing with those uh, that, that truly still feel unsafe, despite some of the, the assurances and things that we're doing. Blaine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, a question of safety is on everyone's mind right now. We have increased campus safety patrols. Our, our direct, executive director of campus safety and security, Jake Nichols, is out in the hallway actually um, here, and so I'm sure he'd be able to answer some of those questions. Um, we have a campus safety escort where students can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week to arrange for a security escort to be escorted across campus during the day or night. It doesn't matter at any point in time. We're also providing resources to students to help them navigate through this from an emotional standpoint. We've had drop-in counseling that has been utilized both in our counseling center as well as the student union building. And we're also supporting students like President Green indicated that if they want to leave and go home now, they absolutely can't. We're, we're going to support them in doing so. Um, many students have questions about their academics and whatnot, but this is a very dynamic, fluid situation. And we want to make sure we're support, supporting students and their families to get through this the way that they need to. Yeah, absolutely. Washington State University is about eight miles that way. What would you suggest that uh, Wazoo does to make their students feel safe if they're unsafe? Uh, yeah, the communication and encouraging students to reach out and use resources. That's a fantastic campus. I, I talked to their dean of students um, in office yesterday, um, and they are mobilizing their support resources. All campuses have supports in place. Students just need to make sure they're leaning in and reaching out to it. And, and many times students don't, but we encourage that. Absolutely. Hi, this is uh, Hadia Thark with the Argona. Um, this may be a question for uh, Scott Green or Blaine. I class, um, they, they gain comfort from interacting and staying busy with their faculty and, and attending classes, labs. Uh, some are working on their semester projects. So we've, we've heard from them. Um, at the same time, we want to provide the, the ability for any student who, who did not feel comfortable stay, staying around, who did not want, uh, who was unable to process that way, that they had that opportunity to go. And we've been helping them as well. These ex these all, all these absences are excused. We've asked our faculty to um, work with, our, with those students who, who chose to, to go. Um, and um, uh, so we felt, felt this was the best way you know, to respond, to give as much flexibility as we could to, to our students and, and our faculty to help manage the situation. And frankly, I think they've done a very, very good job. 
Is the university working with the parents or the families of the victims? Are you in touch with them? They are. I'll turn that back over to Blaine. Uh, I know he's been in, we both have been in contact with the families, but he's been very close to it. And, and so, Blaine, you want to take that question? Absolutely. You know, one of the hardest jobs I have is talking to parents of, of uh, students who have died. It's, it's the absolute worst part of my job. And so I've reached out and made contact with all the families. Um, we've offered our support, um, and we're going to stay in constant contact with them. I communicated with them almost every day. We usually give it a little space and time before we reach out just for the sheer shock of absorbing the loss of a child and, and what that looks like. But we're going to stay in support of them moving forward for the weeks and months to come and in whatever capacity they need. We've talked to a few of them and they've expressed some frustration with the lack of communication from investigators and, and from the officials involved on that side of it. Has the university heard that from them? How are they, how are you working with them to help kind of close that communication gap? Sure. Um, I, I do know that uh, uh, Captain Barrett from the Moscow Police Department is also in constant contact with them. He reaches out to them on a regular basis uh, from that standpoint. I think it's safe to say everyone, the families most of all, want information and they, they they want justice, and um, I, I can't do anything but honor what their needs are and what they are. Whenever I hear a concern from the family members uh, about what's going on, I'll, I'll I definitely make sure I communicate that to the Moscow Police Department. Um, they're very busy. They're working, the, the men and women of this department are working really hard on their behalf and on our community's behalf. Um, but if I can be a conduit to share information, we're, we're absolutely going to do that. Has there been any update on the candlelight vigil that is postponed till after the break? I believe it's November 30th. November 30th. November at 30th. what time? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're looking at 5 or 5.30. We're, we're trying to finalize. Well, let me yeah. <laughs> there was a candlelight vigil that was originally scheduled tonight, but because of the, the volume of students who have left, we want to make sure we're creating a space where they can participate. We don't want someone driving back during this time um, uh, to do that. So we've rescheduled to November 30th. We haven't finalized the time. We will definitely be sharing that out to our students in our community and the larger community. Um, we're, we're just finalizing some details. We're gonna communicate that with the families as well. Um, it'll be on campus. We haven't figured out the location yet because we're gonna be monitoring what the weather looks like. We anticipate a large uh, amount of individuals. That being said, we also have two communities that are just providing beautiful support. There's a candlelight vigil in Boise tonight. Um, in honor of, of, of our, our lost students. And there's also a candlelight vigil tonight in Coeur d'Alene. And I say nothing but thank you and for the love and support from those communities that are, are supporting us. And we've seen that support come across the country and around the world uh, for the University of Idaho and these families. And so it's a beautiful thing. Uh, President Green, could you talk a little bit about the vandal alert that involved the knife and how the university handled it and what you found in that case? Yeah, so basically we were just responding to the information that we had from the Moscow to police, police Department at that time. We have a, a incident response team. Uh, we gathered Sunday as we were notified by uh, the, the Moscow Police Department that there had been a crime committed. Uh, at the time, we weren't sure if they were students or not, um, and, and um, we wanted to provide help to the Moscow Police Department. And... Uh, we think we were able to do that successfully to help them, you know, identify those those students and and uh, contact their their relatives. So, um, you know, beyond that, it was just uh, trying to understand um, what the assessment was of of the risk uh, to the campus, um, and we relied on our subject matter experts, as you've heard, uh, they they know more than any of us about this, and and uh, and then based on that, we made we started making decisions about you know how to move forward this week. Yeah, and so, so what were those decisions around that initial alert? What was the conclusion you had at that point about the level of risk? Well, of course, the, you know, your, your first, you know, on the first vandal alert, it was uh, high risk. You know, we weren't, we had no, really no information. And um, we asked our students to shelter in place and, uh, and uh, you know, until we, we got the all clear, you know, from, well, it wasn't an all clear, but, you know, a reduced risk where, where we, we could, uh, where students could start to move around more freely. Uh, we had people sheltering in places like like the library um, and uh, uh, you know the Pittman Center and and places around campus and and you know we didn't want to keep them there all all night if we didn't have to and and so as soon as uh, Moscow Police Department determined that it was safe for them to to begin moving around and and but be vigilant um, we sent we sent the other vandal alerts. Yeah, yeah, my apology. I, I was meaning referring to the uh, the earlier van vandal alert involving the the threatening with the knife. Um, that it happened uh, in oh. September. Yeah, you, you want you want to respond to that? Thank you, Blaine. So um, that vandal alert, we, we had a group of students walking back to uh, Greek Row uh, from a location off campus. Um, 
they encountered an individual who was not affiliated with the university. Um, they got into, a, from my understanding, a, a verbal altercation and he ended up um, flashing a knife at them. There, it was not a stabbing, it was not a stabbing attack, it, it was a threat um, to the best of, that we know. Um, we sent out a vandal alert warning the individuals uh, of our campus community at that time. I don't have the specific date, but it's it's out there uh, from that aspect of it. And it's my understanding that individual then later turned himself into uh, law enforcement uh, and they've addressed uh, what that happens. So what's not so. connected in any way to this homicide? Uh, that's a question for law enforcement. I, I you know who he is. I, 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 I know about the incident. I don't know the individual because he did not turn, he's not affiliated with the university. So um, my understanding, he turned himself into law enforcement. So I, I can't ask, I can't answer the question of whether he's connected with this or not. So we want to thank you again for coming. That's going to be all the questions we take at this time. Um, we appreciate you coming and spending time with us and uh, we will continue to uh, um, put out information as we have time. And we want to reassure the uh, community that uh, the Moscow Police Department and everybody working on this will do everything we can. We love this community. We've, uh, um, a lot of us have went to the University of Idaho and uh, uh, we are vandals and we will um, do everything we can to solve this. Thank you. Thank you.